gente não se pode demorar 10 segundos, que há logo muitas pessoas a sair. Uh, neste momento não estão aqui, mas uh, eu vou falar da orquestra que nos está a acompanhar mais uh, daqui a pouco. Uh, Interrogo-me se as orquestras não replicarão uma, uma certa parte do modelo de sociedade. Primeiros violinos, segundos violinos, grupos de cordas, de percussão, de sopro, um maestro que só conduz mas não produz nenhum som, mas que ainda assim é fundamental para que todos os outros produzam o som na cadência certa para a obra. Bom, na verdade, independentemente da resposta a esta pergunta, meramente de circunstância, é que a orquestra que nos acompanha hoje é uma orquestra especial. Uh, toca músicas de compositores clássicos, como temos ouvido, uh, mas, na verdade, ao fazê-lo, a tocarem seja que música for, o que estes jovens músicos têm feito é tocar a sua própria vida. E, ao fazê-lo, estão também a tocar a vida deles para a frente. É a Orquestra Geração, é um projeto que está a celebrar agora mesmo 10 anos em Portugal, Uh, e eu daqui a pouco vou falar mais sobre isso, porque vale mesmo a pena, depois de ouvirmos a, a próximo, o próximo debate. E isto porque a música, a orquestra, permite-me chamar a atenção para o processo invulgar através do qual são hoje escolhidos, na maioria das orquestras, os músicos profissionais. Uh, são as provas cegas. Os músicos tocam atrás de uma cortina, uh, desempenham as tarefas que o júri de avaliação lhes pediu, eles tocam atrás da cortina e o júri avalia aquilo que ouviu forma, como foi executada a peça e a forma como soou a música. Não há apelidos sonantes atrás da cortina. Não há género. Quando se ouve um violoncelo, um oboé ou uma flauta atrás de uma cortina, não é um homem ou uma mulher que é o músico que lá está. Não há pessoas mais altas ou mais baixas, não há mais bonitos ou menos bonitos. Isto chegou-se à conclusão de que este processo era o mais justo, porque apesar de ser, ou se calhar por ser a seleção de músicos para uma orquestra, havia muitas condicionantes na escolha dos músicos. E nem sempre se escolhiam os melhores. Aliás, com uma grande frequência se escolhiam os músicos menos virtuosos e menos capazes de desempenhar aquela uh, tarefa. O próximo debate é sobre a persistência das desigualdades. E já vão perceber porque é que este exemplo pode ser significativo. Vamos ter em palco o historiador e professor de economia Gregory Clark, que fez um estudo inédito e muito interessante sobre o impacto do apelido no sucesso das pessoas. E um dos dirigentes da associação Bien, uh, chama-se Philippe Von Paris, assim espero ter pronunciado suficientemente bem o nome, de origem holandesa, que defende um conceito radical, é o rendimento básico universal. Aliás, a organização de que faz parte, e isto serve apenas como ilustrativo e como uh, um fator de ignição um pouco da, da vossa atenção adicional e também do debate, a, a organização Bian esteve reunida esta semana em Lisboa e nesta conferência foi exibido, uh, julgo até que em primeira exibição mundial, um filme de um realizador austríaco sobre uh, a questão do rendimento básico universal. O trailer é provocador, mas ajuda-nos talvez a perceber o que é que está aqui em causa e julgo que não se perde se o partilharmos enquanto de, depois damos entrada aos nossos convidados. If you work hard and play by the rules, you're supposed to get ahead. You have two kinds of people. The rich people and everybody else working for the rich people. Our middle class is falling apart. We saw an explosion of inequality. There is no such thing as a free lunch. My plan is real simple. Everybody gets a basic guaranteed income. This land is your land. Wenn das Grundeinkommen eingeführt werden würde, weil es die Gesellschaft denken kann, dann verändert sich die ganze Welt. A type of freedom that most human beings have never experienced before. Auf alle Fälle ist das bedingungslose Grundeinkommen ist eine äh, Machtumverteilung. In diesem Sinne ist es auch eine weitere Entwicklung der Demokratie auf das nächste Level. It probably carries with it a rather radical redefinition of work 
And with automation and cybernation with us now, we will probably have to do that in our society anyway. The replacement of human beings by computers and robots is going to go on on a huge scale. When do you think will be the time when we don't need taxi drivers anymore? I think it's the future. The idea of a uh, basic guaranteed income has the potential to make a comeback. Everybody, if they want to remain part of the middle class, are going to need some supplemental income. We all could go on perpetual vacation. This land was made for you and me. Este era só o trailer do filme, é uma interpretação de um realizador austríaco. O debate é sobre a persistência das desigualdades, com os uh, oradores Philippe Van Paris e uh, uh, Gregory Clark. O moderador do debate é Fernando Alexandre, professor da Universidade do Minho e o comissário deste encontro. Boa tarde a todos. From this point of view, this is very impressive. So this final debate is about the persistence of inequalities, where we are going to talk about social mobility and social policies uh, to deal with the increasing inequalities. So if, um, if there is social mobility, people tend to, to accept more easily inequality, because if people have the ambition to improve their position, in terms of income, education, or social status relative to, to their parents, they know that by their effort, their work, they can achieve uh, their aims. So, um, so social mo mobility gives, gives hope to, to, to people. Uh, and that's why most of the people uh, support the equality of, of, of opportunities. Because with equality of opportunities, the birth is not, is not fate. Uh, so institutions like education, health and justice are crucial to, to increase social uh, mobility. The thing with in the increasing inequality, uh, the causes of which we have been listening in the, in the, in the, in the previous panels, is that in increasing inequality is also associated with increasing poverty and also with a polarization in the society um, between skilled and then skilled and, and skilled workers, for instance. So, if you have a higher in, in, inequality, you may have um, unequal opportunities for people, because a part of the population may not have the possibility of acquiring the capacities that they need to get a good job or a good life or what they what what they want to be in life. So, the possibilities for people are are are, are reduced. So. That's why one of the reasons uh, higher inequality has been associated with lower social mobility. Therefore, the higher his inequality, the lower the number of dreaming people we have. And, of course, it, it's bad to have uh, uh, a low number of dreamers because we need a lot uh, of dreamers. Um, therefore, there is a challenge in terms of social policies, uh, both to decrease inequalities and to enhance social mobility. Uh, because this way we can improve uh, uh, ourselves and we, we, can, we can strive for a better society. Uh, in this panel, we are very fortunate to have two, um, two persons, Gregory Clark and Philippe Van Paris. Um, Gregory Clark uh, is, um, he has proposed in his last book a theory of social mobility, so he's going to, to, to start his, his intervention by presenting his theory, a very general theory of social mobility. He's a, a very well-known economic historian, he's a professor at the University of California, Davis. He has also held positions at Harvard and is, uh, and is, is now at uh, London School of Economics. He is the author of two uh, very important books on two very important topics, uh, economic growth and social mobility. Uh, both of his books um, have uh, Hemingway-inspired titles. So the first one that was published in 2007 is A Farewell to Holmes, 
And then this last one, where he presents his general theory of social mobility, is the sun also rises. So let's listen to um, Greg Clark's uh, theory of social mobility. Thank you. Social mobility is actually very easy to measure and describe in society. We can describe it with one number, which is just what's the correlation between parents, income or status or occupation and that of their children. And for many, many years, sociologists, economists and others have been measuring this and they reach conclusions which are very powerful and very disturbing. <laughs> and the conclusion they reach is that that rate of social mobility seems to vary a lot across societies. The second interesting thing they find is that there's a lot of social mobility. Despite all of the complaints in societies, they typically find that there's a lot of turnover between generations in terms of status. But they also find that more unequal societies tend to have lower measured rates of social mobility. And this leads to a number of conclusions about social mobility. And the first is that it must be the case in these societies with more persistence, with this higher correlation, that a lot of people of talent and ability are trapped in the wrong occupations, and that a lot of people without talent and ability <laughs> have benefited from family connections. And the intergenerational correlation of income in Sweden is about 0.2. <clears throat> in Chile, in South America, it's about 0.7. And so the conclusion is that there's a lot of people in a lot of societies trapped in the wrong occupations and that every government should have a minister of a uh, ministry of social equality uh, to deal specifically with the problem of social mobility. And the other important thing that you find in these studies is that if the rate of mobility varies so much across societies, then it must be culture, institutions, political arrangements that determine rates of social mobility. And in particular, very little of it can actually owe to genetics or the actual inheritance of underlying abilities through genetic means. Now, as I say, this is the standard world of social mobility. I got interested in this world because as an economic historian, I wanted to measure social mobility going very far back in time. And it's very difficult to get the data to do this because you need to know with the conventional methods both the parent and the child, and so it's very hard to look at, say, medieval England and say, what is the rate of social mobility? And so a journalist from the New York Times suggested a radically new method of doing this. <laughs> and I wish I was the one who thought about this, uh, but this was actually a journalist. And he said, well, what about tracking the status of surnames? England, by 1300, almost everyone had a surname. And in the original creation of surnames, some were high status and some were low. If you were named after a place, you were high status. So Philippe would have, must have descended from a relatively high status family, <laughs> right? Uh, because that meant that you existed outside the place. Uh, if you were named Williamson or something like that, you were typically much lower status. And so we can track those different types of names, and then a lot of names in England refer to the occupation of the originator of the name. <laughs> and so for a lot of people in England, we know that at some stage, 20 generations back, they were a smith or a baker or a cooper, and we can see, well, what's happened to the children of those original occupations? But the second thing that happens in England is that there are many, many surnames. There's about one and a half million surnames in England for 60 million people. <laughs> and so there's a lot of very rare surnames, and just by random chance over time, some of them become very high status on average, and some very low. And so for any generation in England, we can go and identify what are the high status surnames and what are the low status names. If you're in a world of very rapid social mobility, those status differences 
should disappear very quickly. And what you should find is that within two or three generations, the high status names become on average, and the low status names become average. And so we can actually measure the degree of social entropy by what is happening to these names. And so I started doing this study in England, and I discovered, interestingly, that status persists in surnames for incredibly long periods of time. That for high status people to become average takes about 10 generations, 300 years. And it turns out also that this status persistence is the same in the Middle Ages as it is now in this year in England. <laughs> we have not had any improvement in social mobility rates. And to give a number to this, social mobility conventionally measured in Sweden has a correlation of 0.2. In America, it's 0.5, in the bad world of Trump. In the data for the names, it's typically about 0.8 is this persistence. And so it implies that there's some deeper persistence across English society going through all these years. And I have to say the remarkable thing is, as you go through mass education, increases in taxes, the arrival of the labor, the socialist government, none of this has any effect on the rate of persistence of measured by these names. And so then I thought, well, let's go and look at Sweden. Are we going to find some very different story from Sweden? And it turns out in Sweden, they have a whole set of very privileged surnames that are actually protected by law from the common people. <laughs> so to change your name in Sweden, you have to go to the tax authorities and get their permission. And so there's one set of these names are the names of the noble families of Sweden, which are very distinctive. Uh, and uh, Lejon Hufud, for example, Lion's Foot is one of these names. Uh, uh, Oxen Stierna, uh, Ox Star. Um, and, and so you've got this set of names, but there's another set of names which was when people went to university in the 18th century, they would often give up the common names, they, you know, Gunnarsson, stuff like that, Anderson, which changed every generation, and took Latinized names that end in IUS. And so Celsius, most Swedish scientists, have these names. And we can look at the descendants then of the 18th century intellectual elite and of the 18th century political elite, and what do we find in Sweden? There's still an elite. <laughs> there are two to four times more likely to be a doctor, an attorney. They live in the high-priced suburbs of Stockholm. <laughs> they, uh, are more likely to be on the Nobel Prize, Academy, jury. Uh, you've got just the same persistence. And so it turns out, all across the world, when we do these surname studies, there is this persistence, and it's typically at this very high rate. And so then we have to think, well, what is going on here? <laughs> and what the book says is that actually what is happening is that there's a, a deeper type of status that people carry your status genotype, and that that is actually very strongly transmitted from parent to child. But in any generation, there are lots of accidents that transmit that genotype of status into a social phenotype. Did you get accepted to the law school you applied to? Did you get this job? Did you get fired by that mean boss? There's lots of things that intervene. And so what means is that there's a lot of noise at the local level in the social world, but amazingly, people seem to have a memory of their lineage built into them. <laughs> and what happens then is, if you go down a lot and you're from these elite groups, your children tend to rebound. <laughs> and if you're from the, the bottom of the hierarchy, your children tend to actually go back down again if you do better <laughs> on these measures. And so there's this deeper persistence. And then the explanation is, well, why does Sweden seem to be so mobile when they look at something like income? The answer is because in Sweden, there's so much income equality that income is actually not a very good measure of status. There's a lot of noise. If you go to a very unequal society, 
in terms of income, then income becomes a much better indicator of social status. And so it's really just a measurement problem that creates this appearance of these very different rates of mobility. So that's the social world. And so then the question comes up, uh, what is actually fundamentally driving this? And here I hesitate because what I'm going to tell you, I know you're going to hate me when I tell you this. <laughs> But I can't stop myself, because the truth is the, the thing we're interested in. I've actually become convinced that this is actually driven mainly by genetic inheritance of abilities. And one of the things that convinces us of that is that we have been assembling now a detailed genealogy where we're now up to several hundred thousand people in England over 250 years where we can actually look at all the processes of social mobility here. And we're able to do that because the English are famously eccentric. And so there's an entire society in England, the Guild of One Name Studies, which is devoted to people who want to only study the history of their own name. <laughs> and they have 2,500 members, and many of them are now quite elderly, and so it's a race between us and death as to what's going to happen to this incredible sets of data <laughs> that they've collected. But with this data, we can actually do lots of tests that would rule out genetics as being the main carrier of social status. So one of the things, for example, is if you look at adopted children, if genetics is completely unimportant, they're adopted as babies, what should predict their outcomes should just be their parents and the family of their parents. For adopted children, the majority of the outcome is predicted by their birth parents and not the adopted parents. And so we know absolutely that genetics is actually playing the majority role. The question is between 50% and 100%. We can look at things like, what happens to birth order? Does that make any difference? The answer is no on this data. <laughs> what happens to family size? In 19th century, in our data set, family size varied from 1 to 18. It has no effect except for one characteristic, your wealth. <coughs> if you inherit it from your father and you're a bigger family, you end up with somewhat lower wealth. But for occupation, education, these other things, it makes no difference. And if you don't inherit anything from your parents, then it doesn't affect your wealth. So your capability of generating wealth is unchanged. Uh, what else can we test? It turns out that a genetic transmission mechanism would also predict that the correlation between siblings will be the same as the correlation between a parent and child in status. That's unexpected on a social transmission basis, because siblings, I had three siblings, we shared an identical in social environment. My parents, on the other hand, both came from families of 12, and some of them in quite difficult circumstances, and so we had very different experiences. So a social transmission thing would say siblings will be more closely correlated than the parent-child correlation. On the data, it's very clear the sibling correlation is the parent-child correlation. And it varies for occupation, it's like 0.6. For wealth, it's 0.5. For longevity, it's 0.1. But it's always the case that the sibling correlation is the same as the parent-child correlation. And so you cannot prove with observational data that any particular process is at work. But the interesting thing about this data is that it does seem to suggest a surprisingly important role for genetics. Now, when I tell people this, and I can't stop myself, I meet people on trains, and I have to tell them, you know, what, what's my mission in life? Uh, a lot of them say, that's the most appalling thing I've ever heard. <laughs> And I actually think that this is not an alarming fact about the world. What it's actually saying is that in a lot of the social world, now we're talking about ordinary, common or garden social mobility here. We're not talking about the US South. We're not talking about some countries in the Middle East where there's very active discrimination against subgroups. But if we're looking at a society probably like Portugal and certainly like Sweden or Britain, what it's actually saying is that the world is much more meritocratic than most people would expect. That people of talent 
actually tend to do fine. And that people, and that we, you know, it, it, that it's just, there is this luck element, right? There's a lot of elements of luck in life, and so I guess it's a little depressing that we can actually predict so well at birth what the likely outcomes of people are going to be. But the one other conclusion I draw from this is it's impossible to change this rate of social mobility. It's driven by highly assortative marriage patterns. And it turns out that people have to be actually genetically connecting <laughs> to make this possible. It's impossible to change that. If anything, marriage is going to become more assortative over time as women acquire more obvious measures of status. But the evidence around the world is very much that you can change inequality and you can make the consequences of this type of inheritance much less important for people in their lives. And it turns out the case of Sweden shows it doesn't change anything. It doesn't incentivize people to create more inequality. The elites in Sweden have been continuing to function as elites without getting that big a reward from the society in terms of their accomplishments. And so, I actually, I think what it supports is saying that the concentration in society should not be on trying to change social mobility. There's no strong evidence that you can significantly change the rate of social mobility. The concentration should be on reducing the consequences of what is just built into the human condition, inequalities at birth. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Greg. I think we are, we are done with you, okay? There's nothing to do, okay? Everything is genetic, so... <laughs> in the beginning, I, I said that inequality matters to social mobil mobility. He denied that. Institutions doesn't matter. Okay, but we are going back to you <laughs> afterwards. So now we have uh, Philippe Van Paris. He is um, uh, a distinct distinguished philosopher. Uh, he has been proposing, proposing a lot of uh, new different uh, types of social policies to deal with the challenges of globalization, technology, so to reduce inequality in this new context that we have been discussing in this, in this meeting. And he is an emeritus professor at the University of Leuven. He has held positions uh, in Harvard, Cambridge, and uh, several other... Oxford. Oxford, and several <laughs> other in inst institutions. <laughs> Uh, and he has recently published uh, a book, Basic Income, at uh, Harvard University Press, a proposal for a free society and a sane economy. So we are going to have the Professor Philippe Van Paris that is going to give the solutions to all the problems we have been discuss discussing. <laughs> Well, you've heard it, uh, social mobility is much lower than we thought. Little, if anything, can be done about it. And anyway, it doesn't matter that much. Now, um, I'm only a philosopher, I'm all, all these experts, so I like at this sort of conference, I like to learn a lot, and so uh, much, most of my little intervention will be devoted to a critical examination of um, uh, Greg's uh, thesis, in the plural. Uh, I should preface this by saying that I fully agree with one thing you said twice, which is the truth is the truth. Even if we don't like to hear it, even if no one likes to hear it, our job as academics, also because we don't need votes, we don't need uh, people listening to us on the radio, so we, our job, our responsibility is to say the truth, even if no one likes it, not even ourselves. So, um, let me, I'm only a philosopher, I'm also an analytical philosopher, so I'll start off with a little bit of conceptual clarification by making two distinctions that are very important for this particular discussion, and indeed for the whole discussion uh, today. The first one is uh, between absolute social mobility and relative social mobility. Huh? Because, and social mobility is sometimes used in both of these senses, only one of which is relevant for today's discussion. Absolute uh, social mobility 
can be very high in a society if everyone, uh, all, uh, so in all social classes, the children move up uh, relative to their parents in terms of education level, they go to school for longer, their real income, lifetime real income is higher, they get better jobs uh, defined uh, according to, uh, to some criterion of quality. That's absolute social mobility. Relative social mobility is about the changing in positions in society where the people at the bottom uh, in one generation, where the children of the people at the bottom in one generation get to the top at the next generation and so on. And you can have a very high level of uh, absolute social mobility, everyone moves up, with an absolutely zero uh, level of relative social mobility. And conversely, what's relevant for this discussion is only relative social mobility. And so the changes from one generation to generation in the pecking order in society according to some variable. That's one important distinction. The second important distinction is related to equality, the uh, central theme of this conference. Because we need to think about the exact relationship between equality and social mobility we have been discussing. And here, one central discussion, not the only relevant one, is the distinction between equality of outcomes. Outcomes could be income levels, it could be the levels of power exercised by people over their lifetimes, it could be the level of happiness, achievement in whatever sense, versus equality of opportunities. Opportunities, that is, the possibilities, the real possibilities given to people to uh, achieve, to pursue their own conception of the good life. What I also, what I like to call the real freedom given to people. Because, and that's, uh, I think, important to perceive, uh, the relationship between the theme of this event and one of the main mottos, as I understand it, in the objectives of the foundations, which is freedom. Often, equality and freedom are seen as conflicting values. They are not at all, because equality is just a criterion. And the question to ask is, equality of what? And the most meaningful answer to that question is equality of freedom, the equalization of freedom. But not the formal freedom, the sheer right to do things, the real possibility for people to do things. So, uh, equality and freedom are not in tension, but uh, equality or the equalization of real freedom, of opportunities, is one interpretation of what equality means. So what should we go for? Equality of outcomes or equality of opportunities? There is no doubt in my mind that any plausible conception of justice today and tomorrow must be egalitarian in a, some, in a strong sense. The baseline for justification must be the equality of peop in people's resources, in the resources available to people in their lives. But there can be a divergence, a deviation from equality because of personal responsibility. No plausible conception of justice can uh, 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 can fail to incorporate uh, this sort of responsibility sensitiveness. And that means that we have to go for some conception of uh, equality of opportunities, equality of real freedom. What we need is a fair distribution of this uh, real freedom, not an equal distribution of outcomes. It's people's responsibility to, uh, according to their preferences, to do what they think they have to do or they want to do with uh, the possibilities that are uh, given to them. Um, a sensible conception of justice must also be uh, sensitive to efficiency considerations, and so even in terms of opportunities, uh, justice doesn't require the strict equalization of opportunities at all price, that will be relevant to our discussion, but you can settle for a, a sustainable maximin, that is, what justice requires is that the real freedom of those with least real freedom should be as, uh, as high as possible, as broad as possible. This is what I believe 
justice means. So it's a form of equality. It's equality of opportunities. Equality of opportunities is very different from meritocracy uh, because meritocracy means that people get uh, are rewarded according to their talents, their capacities. But of course, these talents and these capacities are opportunities, are possibilities that are distributed in a very unequal way. And justice requires that the effect of these talents should be neutralized. So it's very different from meritocracy. And so one central question in this whole discussion is really then the relationship between social mobility in the second sense, that is relative social mobility, and then equality in the second sense, that is equality of opportunities. That's by way of uh, background uh, clarification. Now, I turn to the, more precisely to the relationship. Is the lack of relative social mobility documented by uh, Greg a problem for social justice understood as equality of opportunities? Certainly, certainly, because uh, the, this lack of mobility means that people with a better family background in somehow measured enjoy a far greater real freedom than others. And this presumably, indeed most probably, far beyond anything that can be justified, that could conceivably be justified by efficiency considerations. Hmm? These efficiency considerations are relevant if you say, well, justice is the maximi sustainable maximizing of the minimum real freedom rather than uh, uh, equality at all prices. But here we need to differentiate between uh, two mechanisms of transmissions of uh, advantage. Because Greg often speaks in his book in, uh, about this social competence, he says, that is transfers from one generation to another. And indeed, if this lack of social mobility is due to uh, these <coughs> some useful capacities that are transmitted from one generation to the other, there can be, uh, you can conceive of a good justification for rewarding these capacities uh, in an unequal way. That is, I mean, those with more capacities, uh, there may be a point, grounds of efficiency, to give them more real possibilities in their life. This can be due to two sort of mechanisms. And in a way, what I found interesting, uh, most, one of the most interesting things in Greg's book, from which he's sort of retreating uh, at the moment, is that the social competence that is transmitted from one generation to another need not be genetic. Even something that's not detected from the parents to the children may be something transmitted in the family, uh, a social competence that's related to a particular way of behaving. For example, the attitude towards thrift, saving, towards effort, uh, towards the postponement of immediate gratification that may be present in the family, even if it's not immediately manifested in every single generation. Hmm? The crucial thing being this family-related social competence, some of which might be, and much of it, according to the latest version of his views, uh, may be genetically determined, but a lot can be uh, a social competence that is present in the family and that you may have uh, sort of inherited in some sense from the role model of your grandfather or your grandmother, even if you parents didn't conform exactly or, were, or that didn't show in, some, in the achievements of uh, your parents. But this transmission, this lack of social mobility may also be due to a number of other elements. The most obvious one is inherited wealth. Uh, I'll return to that in a minute. But it may also be to a network of connections that you owe to your family. Of course, if the fact that you perform better, uh, that you have a higher income, a better job, is due to the connections that you have because of a friend of your uncle that enables you to, to give you a job, what in Belgium we call un piston, uh, and what is due to that, that there is no particular reason to reward that because not, that's not a capacity that is socially useful. 
And also, in fact, some advantage, and I'll also briefly return to that, may be new to the name itself, because there are some names that have a particular aura and that may be an advantage irrespective of the wealth, irrespective of uh, the genes. And so, given this as a background, in fact, to sum up, and then I'll look at that critically, what Greg says is, in fact, or at least suggests, I think claims, <laughs> that one, most of the transmission of advantage from generation to generation is due to the first uh, set of factors, that is, real capacities, whether genetic or not, transmitted from generation to generation. And two, the second claim is that there is very little, if anything, that can be done about it, and uh, very little that must be done about it, also because it's not that important in any way, you cannot try to do what is anyway impossible. Let me then quickly uh, sort of put a number of question marks around some uh, 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 around these two claims. Around the first one, first. Uh, you mentioned yourself that there are some data that uh, don't quite fit in that theory. There is an interesting fact you mentioned, and then uh, I mean, you, the discussion of it is inconclusive, where you see that uh, in Canada there was a significant uh, a number of people lost their job in a firm, and uh, uh, there was a sort of it was a sort of natural experiment, and you could see that uh, the children of the peop of uh, the the workers who had lost their job when these kids were in their teens, that these kids were also. Uh, performing less well in terms of income throughout their lives, or at least at the time uh, they, uh, they were measured. So this is one sort of case in which uh, you have uh, uh, an influence on the fate of the kid that doesn't go through this sort of uh, capacity, or not. Uh, it doesn't fit into, it's certainly not uh, genetic in this case. Secondly, what do we make uh, of uh, the massive and cumulative transmission of uh, wealth through inheritance, now uh, spectacularly documented by Thomas Piketty uh, and others. I mean, surely that plays a role also in the lack of social mobility, at least within one part of uh, the range of the total distribution of wealth. Three, there is the impact of the name itself. Uh, in Belgium, for example, we have this uh, uh, distinction between the petit de, uh, the people with uh, particules, so whose name starts with D with a small d, and the people whose name starts with uh, a D, de, uh, with a big D. Usually with a big D, these are Flemings, and, and you have these names, I know, uh, it just means the, uh, like uh, de vriend means the friend, and so on. But if it's a small d, then it's uh, uh, the French uh, from, and so it's uh, the Bourbon Parme, de n'importe quoi. And in fact, you can buy the shrinking of your D. <laughs> if you pay a sufficient number of uh, thousands of, uh, of euros, you can in fact uh, uh, have an anoblissement. Right? It becomes a noble uh, name if uh, you, from your big D, it becomes a small d. Surely this is sort of asset that uh, can, that is used, in fact, through generations. Of course, it's not a capacity, it's not a social competence in any sense, but it is, uh, uh, it is an asset which can be used in access to a job, because it sounds good if in the board of a new company you have people, enough people with a petit D uh, rather than with a big one. Um, and um, uh, fourthly, there is the connections aspect. Huh? But the piston, the fact that you can uh, uh, count on some uh, relations in your in you surroundings. One puzzling uh, uh, finding, empirical finding, which mm, I don't know how much it generalizes in, in other countries, was that uh, the uh, differential unemployment of people of Moroccan origin, and generally of uh, recent immigrant uh, origin in Belgium, the differential unemployment was much higher for the highly educated than for the low educated. And one, the most plausible explanation for that is in fact, we, in Belgium we overproduce graduates with various degrees, and then what counts on the labor market is no longer the degree you have, but 
the relations uh, your parents have or you have by virtue of living in a certain environment. So I quickly gave these four examples. In all these four cases, the reason why you have this transmission of advantage from generation to generation is not related to a specific social com competence in the sense of a capacity uh, that uh, is possessed by the people who enjoy it. And this sort of inequality related to that could be justified in efficiency terms, but it's due to something else, and therefore uh, not uh, obviously uh, legitimate. Now, uh, related to uh, all this, and that's the second claim, and the second of the two claims I mentioned, and, uh, uh, which is uh, that little can and therefore must be done about it. Well, certainly there are two sort of things that can be done, it seems to me. The first one you discuss, which is can't we reduce this transmission through early education and very early education? You mentioned the um, Head Start program in the US and you say, well, looking at the data, it wasn't very successful. You don't exclude that other programs might be more successful than that. In fact, Pierre-Rosan Vallon this morning mentioned this proposal by La Canal uh, at the end of the 18th century, which was the Maison de l'Egalité, in which all the kids would be put uh, uh, from a certain age. It's a sort of a revival of Plato's old idea of a communal crash for all the kids in order to achieve uh, equality. But I'm struck myself in, in the context of my city, Brussels, how important and how much of a difference it makes to sort of induce uh, kids of uh, foreign origin who don't speak French or Dutch at home to be uh, in a context in which they hear a lot of French, a lot of Dutch from the crash onwards. And it definitely makes a difference to their school trajectory. And so that leads one, I think, to qualify what you say, but there is little to be done about it. Perhaps a Head Start uh, program was not very successful, but my strong intuition in light of what I see around me is that something can be done. The other trickier thing that can be done, which you recognize would uh, sort of accelerate the regression to the mean, is intermarriage. So if we had less assortative meet, uh, 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 mating, uh, if we had uh, more less uh, homogamy, then whether it is genetic or a transmission of a sort of habitus from one generation to a generation, that would improve things in terms of social mobility. You just mix the genes and you mix the, the uh, different attitudes to a thrift and all the rest. I try to do my bit of it, but it may have turned counterproductive. One of my children got you now, can now get these cheap genetic tests. Got a genetic test and what it said essentially is 49% Ashkenazi Jew and 51% wishy-washy. So the wishy-washy part was mine and uh, so obviously they couldn't detect exactly what it was. But, but, I think, so isn't this, in the end, counterproductive? You see, this is good, this is the various social groups um, uh, uh, that prevents the, the Jews from diverging from the mean, as you said, was the case at some point. And um, so is this good? Maybe not that good. And that turns to a, a close uh, connection, perhaps suspicious, dangerous close connection between new views and the views expressed in the bell curve by Hernstein and Murray. Highly controversial book. And uh, there, what they point out is that as a result of uh, uh, women's liberation, uh, you have uh, increasing assortative mating in terms of IQ. They concentrate on IQ. And um, uh, what happens, uh, uh, perhaps one way of putting it, is that we've been moving as a result of that from a Trump pattern to a Clinton pattern. That is, from a situation in which the rich marry the pretty, to a situation in which the clever marry the clever, right? That's a, and, and that's very bad in terms of equality because, in their view, that leads to a polarization of the gene pool in terms of IQ. If the clever marry the clever, the dumb marry the, cle the dumb, well, uh, you, so that if you, so perhaps that's, uh, it's following Murray's recommendation that uh, Trump choose a different road. Maybe. <laughs> um, anyway, so that, uh, the, the, the point is that perhaps it's counterproductive, and then even when there is a mixing 
uh, uh, across ethnic groups, it may be bad in terms of the polarization of the uh, gene pool. Um, nonetheless, for reasons right aptly pointed out by uh, Pierre Rosan Vallon this morning, it, this, all this mixing uh, between groups, uh, immigrant groups of, of all sorts, may be a good thing for another reason that is simply that is relevant for equality, which is social cohesion. That we have a, a société de semblable, a société, société d'ego, which is the sort of society we need for the support of the redistributive uh, institutions. Let me then just close, and uh, so the, after these um, um, uh, critical comments, by saying that there is one thing uh, in terms of policy on which uh, I agree with you and what, uh, which you hinted at at the end, which is, in fact, if justice is the equalization of opportunity, what you need to do is increase, uh, expand the real freedom uh, of those with least real freedom, whether the, the substratum of this real freedom is inherited from generation to generation or not. And so what you need to do, the equalization of opportunities, in a way, is in some sense orthogonal to the uh, reduction of uh, social immobility or social uh, translations. And uh, because I, I promised that I would say something on basic income, but only very little, Fernando uh, asked me to do that, and of course, if to equalize uh, uh, or, and to, to, to give more real freedom, give more real possibilities to the worst of, there are lots of things that need to be done. And one shouldn't have just one pet idea that is supposed to be a panacea. But I certainly believe that the introduction of an unconditional basic income, briefly alluded to or sketched in, in the, the teaser you saw uh, before, is a central idea. So we had in uh, Lisbon, by coincidence, uh, this week, uh, three days of Congress, the 17th Congress of what was initially a small uh, network created in Louvain-la-Neuve in my university town in 1988. Now it's become a worldwide network with sections in India, in China, etc. The last Congress was in Seoul. The one we just uh, decided to have next time will be uh, in uh, Delhi. All over the world you have this, and especially in Europe recently, you have this uh, interest for basic income as a result of the Swiss referendum last year. Benoit Mont, uh, presidential candidate, making its cen central proposal. The experiments in Finland and in other places. Mark Zuckerberg uh, uh, coming out in favor of it. There are lots of people all, all over the world. To connect it briefly, and then I, I shut up, uh, connect it briefly to the discussion we had this morning uh, with uh, Branko and uh, Richard. Um, basic income is not there because uh, it will be the end of work. I don't believe in the end uh, that, that there will be an end of work, but it's closely related to the, uh, the sort of dual impact and the, the very strong uh, impact and the interaction between them of two factors. One is globalization and the other one is the sort of labor-saving technology we have. As a result of that, more and more people, more and more households fall under something like a poverty threshold or feel very precarious, feel that they are their risk because of the unpredictability uh, pointed out by, uh, by Richard, that they, all, they feel on the verge of falling into that. And certainly a lot of the popularity of the idea of basic income is related to that, uh, uh, to, uh, to that fact, that, that new trend. And what a basic income is, huh, uh, is a, a partial replacement of our safety nets by a floor a floor on which you can count because it's strictly unconditional, a floor on which you can stand and organize your life in work and, and out of work, and, and a fluid uh, uh, back and forth between training, the sort of training, continuous education we need in the 21st century, employment and volunteer activities of all sorts. This is what a basic income is. It's a new model of social protection, but will not be a substitute for the previous two models, social assistance and social insurance. It will help these two models function better. Is it a utopia at this stage? Is it something that's not politically feasible? Yes. But so was the abolition of slavery. So was universal suffrage. People saying these people are crazy. But it's because people like you think about that, think about the pros and cons, listen to the objections to it, and then think that after all, it's a good idea, thanks to that, 
And thanks to the fact that people like you think about it long before, or perhaps not so long before, it is actually politically feasible that the thing will be realized in the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, so, Greg, uh, although you, your, your, your results show that there is no relation between uh, inequality and social mobility, the fact is that uh, uh, increasing inequality has been resulting in a polarization of society between skilled and unskilled. Uh, between, uh, you have a, a dual society, uh, mainly in the, in the United States, but, but also in Europe, with people going to different schools and all that. So, uh, what I would like to ask you, although uh, it has reducing inequalities has no implications for social mobility, the fact is that this polarization uh, has some it has risks for society, for political stability, for social cohesion. Uh, what what would you say that we can do, or we should do, or uh, about uh, inequality? So, from your conclusions, from your theory, what are the implications for re redistribution? Let's say. Well, <clears throat> one thing that people, when they assume that greater inequality will lead to lower social mobility, they think about the rungs on the ladder getting further apart. But they don't also recognize that you can take bigger steps in a society where there's more inequality if you get the right education, if you happen to get the right job. Uh, and so that's why I say there's no inherent reason why when we're looking at relative social position that inequality should inherently lead to uh, lower rates of social mobility. Uh, in terms of policy, as I say, I'm, I'm very happy with the thought of trying to do more transfers, trying to reduce uh, these inequalities. Um, if one of the things, though, that people want and need is productive employment, it's not obvious that the society is going to be able to provide that to people at the, the bottom of the social ladder, given trends in trade, technology, otherwise. And so I think in terms of the, the work I do, uh, I could say much more just about the mechanisms of transmission, <laughs> the nature of transmission of status. People then have to decide, once we know the social facts, how do we want to react to those facts, right? And uh, as I say, my own reaction is to say, if the world is much more mechanistic in terms of social position, than people thought, then you have to give up the idea of the American dream where anyone can make it. It's just a matter of, of determination, of pluck, uh, of courage, uh, and then actually realize more that in any society, we have to be thinking about supporting the people at the bottom of that society through uh, supplements. But but the fact is that if the, the, in, the level of income, the level of education, social status, is not the merit of so much. Of course, there must be work and effort and all that. But uh, what, what are the implications for tax policy, for instance? Oh, I, th I, th I think the evidence internationally is that you can tax very significantly without actually influencing much things like social mobility. Right? The highly taxed Swedish upper classes are not all deciding to become bus drivers. <laughs> Uh, because that's about the same earnings as an architect in Sweden. <laughs> they still hold on to education, they're still highly educated, they're still holding on. And so I think the evidence from these studies is that interventions to change tax rates, to provide more educational opportunities, are not correlated at the surname level with any improvements or, or declines in social mobility. And so that's why, as I say, my interpretation is very much from this study is you've got a lot of room in society in terms of redistribution, right? Okay. And the work of my colleague, uh, Peter Lindert, who's actually studied growth and redistribution, also very much supports this idea that actually societies have much more choice that they can make about this. But then, in a society like the United States, the question is, how do you convince people <laughs> that that's the kind of society that they want to do. And that's a, a question about rhetoric and imagination 
and politics and not so much about what we can say technically about social mobility. Okay, thank you very much. So, Philip, the, the, the best income is one of the most uh, popular proposals that you have done uh, for, in terms of social policy. But how do you combine that uh, in terms of equality of, of opportunities? Because you also, you also think that uh, public education, uh, early education, as you said, uh, as the type of James Ackman proposes, has an effect on equality of opportunities and the possibilities of social mobility. So, because in terms of um, uh, uh, in financial terms, let's say, it's, it's not easy because you have a, a, a social state that is uh, working uh, and providing services. And then if you had this basic income, how, how do you do it? Have you... Okay, uh, well, these are many, many questions. At first, there is, uh, of course, a sort of connection, perhaps, uh, uh, therefore, a, a confusion also between equalizing opportunities, giving people greater real freedom, and mobility, even you could call it social mobility, within people's own lifetime. And that is, uh, what you want is, what I want is to give people more real freedom, those with least real freedom, as much real freedom as possible, to move up, and, but especially to move across various occupations that they, they could have. And, uh, and, so, and that's very, certainly very important uh, uh, for me. And education plays an important role in it. But the idea of education, uh, although it may reduce, in my view, especially the early education, it may reduce the degree of transmission from one generation to, to the next. But education should be there, above all, to empower people, uh, whatever, uh, whether, um, whatever they have inherited from, from their own family, to empower them and help them do in their lives what they want, what they like to do, and what they do well. And for that purpose, education is massively important, but please, not the sort of structure of education we have now inherited from the past, that is, not the idea that you give a block to the, to the children, to the adolescents and the young adults, and then they are supposed to be equipped for the rest of their lives. And so, what is of the greatest importance, as important as a transformation in the distribution of income, is lifelong blended learning. That is, blended means the combination of the mobilization of this totally unprecedented wealth of information and knowledge, cheaply available through the internet. It's just, I mean, it's some people sometimes say the younger generation will be poorer than us, but they'll be so massively richer in terms of the information they have access to, providing they can make a creative and, cre and critical use of that knowledge. And so blended learning means that you have online learning through, but at the same time it must be combined with local appropriation in, in neighborhoods, in universities, etc. And throughout people's lives. So let's reduce the initial block uh, and, and then make it far easier throughout life so people will then work longer in their lives. And so there is a waste at the older, in the older, for the, among the older people because of compulsory retirement and things like that. But also there is a waste because people get to burn out in the course of the night. And so, and basic income must go hand in hand with this radical revolution in the way in which we conceive so-called higher education. That must be. And so, and these are only two of uh, the many things that need, need to do. The other thing that's really close to my heart, and uh, my heart bleeds when I see Lisbon in this respect, is that the real freedom to provide this real freedom for all please let's improve our public spaces. And, and, uh, and so beautiful, Lisbon is such a beautiful city, but you have so many cars that spoil your, 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 your public place. And this is very important because we... We'll <laughs> <laughs> ah. <laughs> in Brussels, I move everywhere by bike, but I must say that the hills in uh, Lisbon are a bit tougher than in Brussels. But, but, but it's... it's related to it because we need to live more and more packed together in cities. That means that the private spaces will be very small because they'll be very cheap, very expensive, especially then for the poor people. So the quality of the public spaces, public spaces, and there's this li little Largo which was protected from the cars, but all the rest. So please, I mean, make it possible for your politicians to go. It's always difficult, but... Well, we have uh, elections tomorrow, so... <laughs> <laughs> 
I hope the future mayor is in the room. <laughs> okay, so let's take some questions from the audience. Um, yes, please stand up. Posso fazer a pergunta em português? Sim. Translate for us. Quando diz que que o nome, que o apelido é determinante na, na, na igualdade de oportunidades, o que é que significa esse apelido? O que é que constrói esse apelido? Porque eu penso que quando se olha para um apelido, vê-se condições socioeconómicas, vê-se condição sociocultural, vê-se uh, uma história de gerações eventualmente qualificadas ou não qualificadas, vê-se o acesso a determinado tipo de recursos os apelidos trazem toda esta carga envolvida, não é um mero apelido. E como aqui já foi dito, até se podem comprar ou podem se esquecer. E para não me alongar muito, eu gostava, porque isso faz lembrar um pouco os, a, a explicação da sociedade de castas, a sociedade que à partida está praticamente definida. Eu gostava que me dissesse como é que interpreta que haja empresas familiares que vão à falência à segunda e à terceira geração. Como é que explica que haja imigrantes de sucesso que mudaram o seu nome de origem familiar? Onde é que está o peso do apelido nesse sucesso, nessa mobilidade social ou nessa perda, nessa despromoção social? Well, I think you, you can, she's asking if you can, be a, you can give a bit more of detail about the meaning of the, of the, use, of the use that you have done of the surnames in your research. So, um, well, one, I can actually answer a point that Philippe uh, raised, which is that in England, these surnames are so rare that most people don't know the status of them. No one can know the status of 1.5 million surnames. <laughs> and I can actually, if I had an English audience, I would show them a list of very poor people and very rich people with rare names, and they would not be able to tell which list was which list. Mm -hmm. And so the nice thing about England is that the surnames themselves are not doing the work. And then with this data in England, we can also see how common it is for people to change surnames. So for example, Cambridge University has a complete list of what people's names were when they entered and what their names are later in life. And interestingly, less than 1% of people in Britain change the names uh, over their lifetime. And these changes that came in Cambridge, it was Germans after World War I adopting English names. <laughs> uh, and a few cases, but not a huge number of uh, Jewish surnames being changed to more Anglified names. <coughs> and, and so, as I say, so, so that's why in something like England, we can do, we have such wonderful data on the names there, the frequencies. We have all kinds of different measures of their status. We can do similar things for Australia. Other societies, you run into this problem that the names actually do indicate what your religion is, mm. what your social group is. So in India, which has actually even lower measured social mobility, there are Brahmin surnames, there are uh, uh, lower caste surnames. And so there the problem is that there's a very clear signal. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, as I say, so those are less good studies because people then have some chance uh, to react uh, to the names. But I suspect in a society like Portugal, uh, if someone did enough research, they would find a set of relatively elite names, but not even names that people knew particularly were elite, that you could actually do some kind of similar uh, investigation with. Okay? Does that help in terms of understanding? Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, Already, it also yeah. asked about immigration, so how you deal with immigration? Mm. Oh, um, in the British data, one of the things that generates unusual names is actually immigrants. But that's fine. Uh, and so the Huguenots came in in large scale, they have unusual names, they're very high status in Britain. But then we can track well, what's happening to them, how much are they integrating uh, into the society. Uh, and then, as I say again, uh, intermarriage, it, we can also observe social groups that never intermarry. Mm. 
-hmm. And one of the things that supports the genetic interpretation is that those groups do not regress to the mean. So in Egypt, for example, the Copts have very distinctive surnames. They have not intermarried with the Muslim population for more than a thousand years. They have retained a high social status relative to the Muslim population for that entire period. And so again, you know, we get lots of kind of hints about, but it, this could also be interpreted yeah, as, a, as a cultural uh, well, source. Sounds but more it, plausible. But it turns out that if they did regress to the mean significantly without intermarriage, that would disprove the idea that it could be a genetic explanation, right? So there are lots of tests we can do that would just rule out genetics as playing this role. And it turns out that one of the reasons India seems to have such slow social mobility is the absence of intermarriage between social groups mm. in India. And so we definitely see that social groups that don't intermarry tend to be more permanent. And, and the Jewish population in America is regressing just like the rest of the population to the mean. The Jewish population heavily intermarries with the rest of the population. And so, as I say, we do see this association between intermarriage and kind of uh, social status uh, exclusivity. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question? Good afternoon. I've got a question for Professor Clark. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the book by Walter Scheidel, The Great Leveler, mm -hmm. where the author, the author claims that uh, um, inequality can only be significantly reduced by major disruptive events like wars, pandemics, natural catastrophes. Do you find any evidence of these events in your tracking of surnames? Uh, do they have lasting effects or somehow the uh, dominant surnames rebound in the wake of those events? Um, what you see in Britain is significant changes in the degree of inequality over time, but not in any way associated with the underlying uh, status correlation of surnames. The Industrial Revolution has no effect. Right? Even though it's relocating economic activity to the north of the country, it's doing all these other disruptions, uh, World War I leads to a big increase in equality in Britain, but it's not in associated again with any kind of clear sign of, of change in this rate of social mobility. Uh, the general claim actually that the only things that reduce... So, so Schneider's book is, is very interesting because basically it says we're on the path to hell and the only remedy is for Trump to launch a war against North Korea or something like that, as, uh, as because it's, that, it's only wars and epidemics that ever are associated with declines in inequality. And the only thing I would say about that is that that's based on a relatively thin evidential basis, right? Because it's very hard to measure inequality in early societies. And so you've got actually relatively limited uh, evidence on this. But as I say, there is this suggestive association that, that both World War I and World War II led to significant increases in equality across a number of societies. Um, but in some cases, wars are associated with massive devastation, destruction. In societies that are, 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 you know, that are going through this change, like America after World War II, it's not actually associated with cataclysm in that sense. It's associated with the big revival of the war from the Great Depression. And so, as I say, it, it's, it, the, the problem with the book is there's no real idea of what the underlying mechanism is that would explain what is a, a some, uh, an observed association, but not an incredibly strong or robust association. So, do you want to say something about this? Or? No. <laughs> Good, but uh, I prefer to hear more questions from you. Hello. Um, I love the idea of the bottom income for everybody, but I'm wondering if um, perhaps uh, it uh, really turns everybody to just consume more, because pro 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 uh, sorry, richness or poverty is something that is relative, it's not uh, absolute, is always a concept that uh, we always uh, compare ourselves to the ones that are surrounding us. So if the bottom is higher for everybody, everybody just wants to consume more. So perhaps 
will lead to absolutely the same level that, that we are now? Um, it's, it's a question to you, because uh, I'm not sure that uh, we could uh, really live in a very different way just because having a little bit more money, every, every prices will rise, everything will stay the same. It's, it's a question. Okay, I'll answer that question, but I would like to know where the voice came from, because I couldn't uh, <laughs> wave over here. Uh, where? Here. <laughs> ah, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, um, well, um, many things in your question. First of all, uh, uh, a basic income means uh, uh, un unconditional, that is strictly individual, no means that, so it's given to the rich and to the poor, and no conditions into, in terms of availability for work. But it does not mean that everyone's income will go up huh, in nominal terms. That would only happen if you funded this basic income for everyone through money creation. And obviously, if you, create it, if you fund it through money creation, it leads to inflation that will partly annul uh, the effect, and uh, if, if you keep giving it from month to month, it will lead to, uh, to, to runaway inflation. Sometimes it's useful to do it in this way, and a number of people have been arguing for so-called quantitative easing for the people, telling the, uh, the European Central Bank, and they had some hearing, some, some, they paid some attention to that, uh, instead of trying to reboot the, uh, uh, the Eurozone economy, uh, through uh, the private bank system, give a one-off basic income to everyone. But the pipes, in order to get the money to the, to, to the citizens, were not there, and that wasn't really administratively possible. But of course, if you want to fund the basic income in a sustainable way, you need to use taxation, some form of taxation, not necessarily personal income taxation, but something else, and that means that the total purchasing power will not be increased. Will, um, that's the first one. Second point is, uh, depending of course on the level, there will be a big or a small redistribution to the poorer people in society. Hmm? But, uh, and, and of course then you could say, well, it increases their purchasing power, these people are poor people, uh, will they consume more? Yes, they will consume more and they need to consume more and some other people who are rich will need to consume a bit, a bit less. There's nothing bad about it, there's something uh, good about uh, a, a fair distribution of, of this income. But what is crucial about the basic income is that it's not only, it's not even mainly a redistribution of income. Because sometimes in terms of income compared to the current system with the, in the countries that have a guaranteed minimum income, the, the, with a modest basic income there won't be that much redistribution in terms of uh, income, but there will be a redistribution in terms of freedom, huh? because you both increase the freedom to say yes to certain jobs, because you can accept an internship or a, a, a part-time job that involves a lot of training, which you couldn't accept now because this doesn't pay enough or too irregularly, and increases the power to the real freedom to say no to certain jobs, the, the shitty jobs with an awful boss where you don't learn anything, you can more easily say, no, sorry, I'm no longer doing that job. So that uh, a, ba a basic income performs that role, and which is more about increasing the power of the people than about increasing their level of consumption. Okay, thank you very much. We still have time for our last question. Hello, uh, my name is Rui, uh, in here in the back. Um, okay. My question is regarding uh, Gregory Clark presentation, and I didn't, I, I could not follow um, exactly how one can leap from family name influence on the social mobility to the genetic influence on that. So, we nowadays know that genetics are not um, a determined thing. 
So our, the color of our eyes is genetically determined, but our social abilities are not uh, a, the product of one gene by itself. So I think it's a, a huge, giant leap saying that even with, if we manage to keep the genes in one only family and not having a contamination of that genes by other families, it still is a huge leap to say that the genetic pool of that family has a major influence on what those social abilities of those family, of, of, that, that, of, of the people of the, that family would be. And even regarding, even if we accept that uh, the genetic has a major role on the social abilities of those individuals, we also know that genetics are influenced by uh, the um, environmental, inf uh, by the environment. So, for instance, gene uh, methylation is something that influences the expression of those genes and what passes on to the next generation. I, I would like a, a comment on, on, uh, on that. Yes. Uh, now, of course, in a 20-minute presentation, it's hard to lay out a whole elaborate uh, story. Uh, it's factually incorrect to say that people's social behavior is not genetically determined. They now have a genetic predictor of how much education you will get. But the important thing is the way this type of genetic transmission occurs is typically through hundreds and hundreds of different genes, each of which has a very tiny influence. And it leads to a particular type of genetic inheritance, which is additive genetic inheritance, where these combinatoric effects become much less important, right? And so it's not a single gene, it's potentially thousands of different genes, each of which playing a, a very modest role. They do know that these genes actually exist because now we do have these predictors. And, and now with 23andMe and the other uh, gene testing labs, we now have almost a million samples of complete genomes with links, also information on education, height, various other things like that. And the only trouble is it's all middle-class white people. And it turns out these results don't generalize, but we do know, for that group at least, that there really is a kind of genetic uh, substrate. Now, the interesting thing is they don't find as strong an influence as you would expect from this data on the persistence of status with the names, right? But I also described that we have many other studies, the adoption studies, that very clearly indicate very important roles for genetics, right? And, and I mentioned one, but there are many others that all clearly show this. We can compare identical twins with uh, paternal twins and look at the increase in correlation in terms of outcomes, where again, we largely know that that's going to be genetic. It turns out there's a whole background there. And, and as I say, the question is not, does genetics matter? The question is, just how significant is it within this area? But I think we're out of time. Okay, thank you very much. We are, we are the, the, finish, the, the time is out. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philip. Thank you very much, Greg. Obrigado a todos.